Hello everyone, today we're going to be talking about James Joyce's Dubliners published in 1914 with my special guest, Professor M. Keith Booker from the University of Arkansas. Professor Booker, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. All right, let's begin. So here's James Joyce, um, who is probably the most important modernist author. James Joyce was born in Dublin into a declining middle-class family. In 1904, he left Dublin for continental Europe. He lived there for the remainder of his life. Um, Dubliners was published in 1914, but he wrote the majority of the stories. Most of them were written by 1904 and uh, uh, a portrait of the artist as a young man in 1916. Um, so it's a rewrite of another novel, uh, a Stephen Hero, that was abandoned in 1907. Uh, later he went on to write, Uly uh, write Ulysses, that was published in 1922, and Finnegan's Wake in 1939. Professor Booker is just going to give us a little bit of um, information about the uh, a portrait of the artist as a young man. Yeah, well, I think all of Joyce's work uh, is important, and a portrait of the artist as a young man is particularly important historically because it's the first fully modernist work uh, that Joyce wrote, and so it's the point where he emerges as a full-blown modernist artist, just as modernism itself was really just emerging in a full-blown form. Uh, and then, of course, Ulysses, though, is the text that uh, his reputation really rests on more than anything from 1922. Unfortunately, it would take the whole semester to study Ulysses. It's really very complicated, but it, mm -hmm. it is uh, a magnificent masterpiece, widely regarded as the greatest novel uh, ever written. And, and it really is the text. We'll, we'll talk a lot of, you know, you'll hear a lot of talk about how Joyce is the greatest modernist writer and so on and so forth. And, and that reputation is very much deserved, I think, but it rests mostly on Ulysses. And then Finnegan's Wake is even more complicated than Ulysses, but it's so complicated that it's almost unreadable. So it's, it's a book that's uh, much studied by Joyce professionals mm -hmm. uh, and much admired and loved by them, but uh, it's almost impossible for ordinary people to read because Ulysses has been studied so much and explained so much I think over the years, Ulysses has actually gotten more and more accessible so that more and more people are able to read it now if you just have a little patience. Uh, Dubliners, on the other hand, is a good place to start with Joyce, not just because it's his first book, but because it is so accessible, because it, he hasn't quite developed the complexity that you would see in his later work. Yeah, I mean, I have explained to my students before that you have taught uh, Ulysses at I mean, one chapter of Ulysses to your students, your undergraduates, and that how you had written like a whole chapter that really explains things almost line by line for them to be able to understand uh, that chapter. So yeah, pretty much every line of Ulysses mm -hmm. uh, has so much complexity and depth to it that mm -hmm. you have to stop and explain. A lot of referencing. Mm -hmm. A lot of references that are that would have been actually, in, in this case, more accessible back when he wrote the book because there, the book is set in 1904, even though it's published in 1922, uh, and it uh, has a lot of contemporary 1904 references that people in 1922 might still remember, but that people today wouldn't, exactly. even people in Ireland. Yeah, true. So Joyce had already written 12 out of 15 stories of Dubliners by the time he was um, 23. Um, and like we've mentioned before, he was a really good writer, but he hadn't yet developed his modernist style um, completely uh, writing these uh, stories. That's something that really developed later on, and especially we can see that in the dead. When we discuss it, we're, we're going to talk about that. So... Um, uh, in 1904, he published three stories, uh, The Sisters, Eveline, and After the Race, in an obscure uh, uh, weekly public publication called The Irish Homestead. 
Um, by the next year, he had written nine more stories, uh, conceiving of the 12 stories together as a collection to be called uh, Dublin Man. So um, Professor Booker is going to tell us a little bit about the trouble with the censorship, but we're not going to talk much on that. Yeah, one of the things you'll notice, Dubliners was published in 1914, but he'd finished most of it by 1904. The reason you have that 10-year gap uh, is because Joyce had so much trouble uh, getting the book published because uh, very strict censorship laws at the time could have led to uh, him being arrested, could have led to the publisher being arrested, could have led to them at least paying steep fines. Uh, and so there, there was a real struggle because there, there really, really was a very kind of uh, puritanical uh, code in place with regard to literature at the time. Yeah. So when he wrote these, uh, those original 12 stories, he submitted them to a publisher by the name of Grant Richards, who was actually a pretty prestigious publisher. Uh, in London, and Richards accepted uh, the book for publication and, and expressed a great deal of admiration for it, sent it off to the printer to be printed. By this time, Joyce had added another story, uh, Two Gallants. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but uh, when the printer received the manuscript, he refused to print it. Uh, he said that, no, I think that this uh, is, book is actually breaking uh, England's obscenity laws, and we'll all be in legal trouble uh, if we print this thing. Uh, and then for basically for the next 10 years, Joyce went back and forth with publishers trying to iron out the difficulties uh, over the censorship. But I think in a way, even though I'm sure it was very frustrating to the young Joyce, in mm -hmm. a way it, it, it made Dubliners a much better book because it gave him time to develop that modernist style and to add the dead onto the other stories. And the dead is really what makes Dubliners. Dubliners would be an interesting collection of short stories without the dead. Exactly. Uh, but once you add the dead, it becomes something truly special. Uh, and, and really, in a way, it almost becomes a sort of novel. I mean, there's some really interesting ways in which these stories are interlinked. They're not just simply separate. You don't have a lot of crossover in terms of characters or events. Uh, but uh, the, the sort of thematic connections between the stories are very important. And you also see this kind of evolution of consciousness throughout the uh, the text, which is something that's really central to portrait of the artist as a young man. Mm -hmm. But basically you have a young boy in the, at the center of the sisters, and then in each story, the protagonists tend to get a little bit older and a little bit older till the time you get up to somebody who's maybe in his mid to late 30s with Gabriel Conroy in the dead, and uh, and then that's that's as far as it ever goes, but the, you almost get to see sort of uh, the evolution of, uh, of a, a, a kind of uh, representative Dubliner from uh, early childhood up until uh, almost middle age. True, yes, exactly. And we're going to talk in our next slide about Joyce and the birth of modernism, and we can kind of see that more evolved, really, in the story of the dead. So uh, some observers have seen the transition between the earlier stories and the dead as a uh, key to Joyce's development as a modernist writer, and we've already discussed this, and that the stories that came before the dead are really relatively conventional in their form, and they're impoverished in style and vocabulary. Uh, the dead is really more complex, it's ironic, flamboyant, announcing the arrival of Joyce as a modernist author, which some might equate to the birth of genuinely modernist literature as a whole. So the earlier stories, however, are revised by the dead, so becoming more complex because of their dialogue with it. And I really think that's the connection that we should probably focus on, is that how the dead ha uh, basically um, has that complex dialogue with the other stories, right? Yeah, some people have even argued that the dead retroactively uh, sort of causes you to change the way you view all the other stories, uh, ironizing mm -hmm. them to the point where they themselves become moderns and are no longer, you can no longer see them in the same way once you've gotten through the dead and, and figured out what's going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, some people start seeing the same things happening uh, 
uh, you know, earlier in the dead. But I think in some ways that's an illusion. I mean, that's something that readers are adding to the story that Joyce didn't really put there. But, you know, readers are free to, to read stories in a lot of different ways. Yeah, but without the dead, you really do not see that. I mean, it's the dead no, that no, really no, adds no, that no, kind of reading. It never occurred to anybody to see the earlier stories as modernists if mm -hmm. the dead hadn't been there. And so that's why I think it's just really important at this point to mention uh, and make it clear that Joyce is a modern story, but Dubliners without the dead do not represent modernist writing. Is that correct, Professor Bukhar? Yeah, I think what's special about Dubliners with relation to modernism, again, is that it kind of shows the birth of modernism. You have this one block of mm -hmm. 14 stories that aren't modernist, and then you suddenly have a story that is modernist that was written several years later. And in between, he had been working on that novel, Stephen Hero, that you mentioned, and that's mm -hmm. really where he developed his modernist style, as in trying to come to grips with Stephen Hero, which is very autobiographical, so he was sort of mm -hmm. writing about himself, but he wanted to get the proper ironic distance uh, in that book and just found that he couldn't do it with a realist style and eventually developed a more oblique modernist style. Yeah, cool. Um, so there are several themes to keep in mind uh, while reading um, Dubliners, and especially if you want to see that dialogue happening between the dead and the other stories. Um, and uh, these um, uh, features, um, uh, that, uh, sorry, these uh, themes and characteristics uh, that are relevant to the modern experience in the city uh, are really kind of more relevant to the dead, like we said, but like it's just important to keep them in mind if you want to see that connection between the dead and the other stories. So alienation in the modern city is a key modernist concern. Uh, but again, Dubliners, um, Ireland, sorry, happens to be in this uh, position that's just really complex. Uh, the colonial position um, with the British Empire and then the power of the Catholic Church. So it really kind of puts Ireland in a particularly oppre oppressive environment. So even if there is like a little bit of that kind of uh, urban experience, it's not really kind of a full-blown um, experience, right? Yeah, and I think it's important to recognize that throughout the 19th century, the British Empire and the Catholic Church had basically been mortal enemies. They were sort of struggling for power Mm -hmm. against each other so almost everywhere where they met up in the world they were rivals but ireland's the one place where they seemed to largely cooperate mm -hmm. by the 20th century and so the irish were particularly uh oppressed because they had these two powerful forces that should have been kind of balancing each other off but instead mm -hmm. were reinforcing one another exactly and so individuals in dublin repeatedly see ways um, creatively to define their identities, then basically they repeatedly fail. Um, the style of the stories, stripped down, barren, the vocabulary reflect uh, Joyce's view of the poverty of life in Dublin. But later on in The Dead, you kind of see that, uh, uh, that it points toward a p uh, the potential of something uh, better, like life in Dublin might be better things might get better. Uh, so there is a sense of that uh, in the dead that you really don't see in the other stories. Um, there are general historical conditions underlying modernism, of course. So there's a generalized sense of pessimism, crisis, spurred by the collapse of Western capitalist economies in the late 19th century and topped off by the horrors of World War I. So all of you know, the reasons to make people feel like they're living in a world that's basically declining and falling apart and uh, just made people feel like you know, the world is just getting to its like, end. Uh, recognizing and uh, democrat democratization of the European society. So the European society is transforming and changing um, in a way that it would never go back to the way it was, okay? And so 
there is also transformation of capitalism and the rise of consumerism and then we have modernism as artistic response any comment on that oh well uh, not really i think you covered it well just to, just to emphasize that you know you, you have all, all these changes going on in the world that made uh, artists feel like the conventional realist art of the 19th century was just no longer adequate uh, to capture the texture uh, of modern life. And so they were trying to develop new forms of expression. And Joyce, again, with the dead, really led the way in that. Exactly. Um, again, basic characteristics of modernism, a uh, sense of intense social, pol political, and cultural crisis. Like I said, that things are in crisis. Things are just not stable, OK? Uh, complex relation to the literary tradition and to the past in general, and that's just Professor Booker just commented on that point, where they felt like the rejection of realism. I mean, they want something more adequate to uh, the um, condition that they're, you know, living right now, uh, something more suitable, and that they feel that the uh, that realism and the literary tradition from the past is no longer. Uh, adequate to, to their experience. Uh, formal complexity and uh, experimentalism, including intense self-consciousness, so self-consciousness, and focus on art and the artist as the subject of the art, um, and the exploration of the nature of human subjectivity, uh, which suggests that subjectivity is in crisis, and the emphasis on the city. We also have key modernist themes uh, like art and the special role of the artist, alienation and the loss of shared values. Um, and I mentioned this to, I always mention this to my students and say about the alienation uh, and the experience in the modern uh, city where like people in traditional societies always feel like they have shared values and shared experiences and you feel like you no longer have that common um, experience and shared values among people or neighbors or whatever so uh, and that kind of makes you feel that you're more alienated and that you feel like your experience doesn't match the experience of people who are around you um, and the quickened pace of life and the regimentation of time um, that's also part of the modern a modern uh, experience you know you work in uh, a certain job or if you're a student you have to be thinking about time in a more kind of regimented uh, way you have uh, you have to be at your job at a certain time or at your lecture at a certain time you have to submit some work um, um, you know there's a certain deadline for things right and so um, you're not just like as free uh, would you talk to us a little bit about the concept of time and how it was when, like, you know, people were all basically peasants and... Well, yeah, in the Middle Ages, yeah. you know, literally nobody really even thought about what time it was. Mm -hmm. The concept the of time, yeah. They were more concerned with things like whether it was, you know, darker or, or light. But, uh, and, and things really ran more with the rhythm of the seasons, you know, mm -hmm. their, their plans. They didn't say, oh, what am I going to do by 2 o'clock this afternoon? Mm -hmm. They said, oh, what do I need to get done this spring? What do I need to get done this summer? You know, that sort of thing. So it was a much different kind of pace. And, and it was really dictated by the, the natural cycle of time because everybody had to, you know, plant their crops at a certain time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you say plant them at a certain time, there's several weeks really of leeway in there. And then you have to harvest them at a certain time, but there's also a, a broad period there. It's not like at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or whatever. Exactly. Uh, and then when capitalism came along, it's a very complicated system that requires a lot of different people to do what they're supposed to do when they're supposed to do it. You know, it has a lot of moving parts. Uh, and so in the 18th century, when capitalism really first became dominant in England, uh, you saw the beginnings of a real transformation uh, in life to where people had to get things done not only by a certain time of the year, but by a certain time of the day, uh, and and very often down, you know, regimented in factories that begin to grow up in the mm -hmm. 19th century, regimented down to the second. You know, you had s s 
people that were working after you were waiting for you to do what you had to do before they could do what they had to do and so exactly. on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and then when we get to the 20th century, as this capitalist system really cranks up into high gear because mm -hmm. of the rise of consumerism that you mentioned earlier, uh, it just gets all the more complicated and all the more regimented. Uh, and people uh, often felt very, very oppressed by this because it, it was still new. People really weren't accustomed to having their lives so scheduled out for them. Exactly, yes, very scheduled. And then we have the probing psychological depth, okay? And I really think that's um, really part of a rise in individuality, right? Like you think about yourself as a person, as a subject. It, not it's like definitely a, a consequence. And on, on the large uh, scale, it's a consequence of uh, individualism for sure. Uh, but one of the consequences of individualism was really the birth of what's sometimes called psychologism in the late 19th century, the work of people like Sigmund Freud, for mm -hmm. example, who started to study in depth how the human mind works. And Freud was hugely influential. All modernist artists, I think it's safe to say, were familiar with the work of Freud. And some of them were very directly influenced by Freud, like D.H. Lawrence's work is almost all very Freudian. Uh, Joyce was a Freud skeptic. He didn't necessarily believe in Freud, but he definitely addressed Freud in his work in some very direct ways. He lampoons it in uh, Finnegan's Wake. There, there's a lot of uh, Freud jokes in Finnegan's Wake. Uh, but uh, in Ulysses, uh, you see him still probing into the inner thoughts of his characters. Most of what happens in Ulysses really happens inside the characters' minds rather than out in the physical world. And uh, Dubliners begins to move in that direction, but it doesn't go to that extent uh, that you see in Ulysses. Exactly. And the new frankness and detail in dealing with sexuality. Um, can you explain this point? Well, I mean, in the 19th century, again, European literature was pretty prudish, and you didn't have a lot mm -hmm. of open acknowledgments of sexuality of any kind. I mean, this was why Joyce, all the problems that Joyce had with the censors had to do with his representations of sexuality, which doesn't mean that he was describing, you know, graphic sexual activity. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like that uh, in Dubliners at all, but just almost just to admit that people had sexuality was problematic uh, exactly. at that time, especially in Ireland. The Irish, because of the impact of the Catholic Church, were particularly uh, restrained uh, about uh, being able to write about or talk about sexuality of any kind. So the urban emphasis of modernism. There are observers such as George Sinnell who theorized that the bustling and new cities of the modern world would bring about fundamental changes in consciousness. Uh, French poet Charles Baudelaire coined the term modernity in the middle of the 19th century and envisioned the figure of the flaneur. Who is the flaneur? He's someone who walks around, okay, uh, walks about in the modern city, soaking up the experience that the city offers as the epitome of this uh, phenomenon. Joyce's portrayal of Dublin, especially in Ulysses, is a central example of the urban emphasis of modernism. Would you like to um, tell us a little bit more about the Flaneur? Uh, the flaneur is, you know, uh, just uh, sort of an observer. And the idea is that you see things from his perspective, uh, and uh, the Baudelaire tries to capture the notion of, you know, that the modern city is just a, a different environment than anything people have experienced before, much more confusing, much more complicated, much more difficult to really get your bearings and figure out where you are in relation to everything else and uh, m many of the great works of modernism are focused on some specific city like london or new york for example mm -hmm. uh dublin is much smaller and much less modern than than london or new york uh, in, at the beginning of the 20th century uh but in some ways that makes it even better to as an object of representation because joyce can sort of capture mm -hmm. uh more of the totality of life in dublin um, just because it is smaller. It's yeah, very so like a smaller scale. Exactly. Yeah. 
and he does it, you know, with intricate detail. Even though he has all, when you get to U Ulysses, he has all of these spectacular stylistic flourishes, but he was still very, very careful to get the physical details about mm -hmm. the city uh, accurate. And even though he was living off in Paris at the time, his brother was still back in Dublin, and he would constantly write letters back and forth to his brother asking for details, asking his brother to go to some specific address and tell him what mm -hmm. the house there looks like. And, you know, he wanted to get every little detail exactly right. Exactly. So the first story that we're going to be discussing in the collection is the sisters. The opening of the story calls attention to three words that you need to keep in mind throughout your reading of the stories um, uh, in the collection. The word paralysis, simony, and gnomon. Paralysis indicates basically general state of life in Dublin, where no one seems to be able to make any significant moves. It's really hard to overcome uh, your uh, situation um, or, or transcend it. Uh, Joyce would return to this theme um, uh, again and again in his work, making it increasingly clear that this view uh, uh, of the paralysis results from an oppressive exercise of power in Ireland by the British Empire and the Catholic uh, Church. Uh, simony is the granting of religious favors in exchange uh, for money. Um, it indicates Joyce's view of the Catholic Church in Ireland as spiritually bankrupt and uh, interested primarily in its own wealth and power and really not really helping uh, people. And I'm on a geometric figure from which a piece is missing. So it suggests the incompleteness of life in Dublin. Like in every story, we're going to see that there is some piece or part that is missing from this person's uh, life or experience. And these words are all introduced in the very first paragraph uh, through the mind of the young boy uh, who's the protagonist of the story. Uh, and uh, you, you see here a couple of things. I mean, one is the words are very relevant, as you pointed out, to the themes uh, of the stories. And in particular, what happens at the beginning to set off this whole story is that Father Flynn dies uh, having suffered from paralysis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, it's also the case that you can see how the little boy's thinking about Father Flynn's paralysis, and that makes him think about simony and gnomon, not because they're necessarily directly related in meaning, but just because they're sort of like fancy words. They're, they're words that he's been studying in school and things. That, you know, He's still trying to learn about the world. He still has this curiosity. He's still fascinated by language. Uh, but unfortunately, most people in Dublin, we'll see in the course of the book, lose that kind of childish curiosity as mm -hmm. they uh, go forth. But Joyce, of course, is the exception, manages to keep his imagination through it all. Yeah, I mean, it's th the idea, the suggestion is that it's just hard to transcend your situation, but it's not impossible. So um, the young boy, who is the narrator, um, is faced by a decided lack of effective authority figures with whom to identify in his uh, attempt to self-constitution. He doesn't have a father figure. And so, like Professor Booker has just said, that the story is incomplete, like Naman, because the boy narrator uh, does not understand all that he sees. Uh, the boy lives with his aunt and uncle, um, and uh, I mean, uh, he doesn't have parents, uh, like I said, and uh, he doesn't, uh, so, and, and, and uh, one of the things in um, Dubliners is that representation of children who don't have, like, uh, paternal um, figures, especially fathers that are uh, consistently absent, and uh, they're just not there, and you don't have, like, a uh, uh, an appropriate or effective uh, role model uh, for the uh, children. And so the boy... And I think, uh -huh, yeah. and I think parents are also sort of uh, function as a, an image of the past. Uh, and one of this part of the message that really is made very clear in The Dead, but that runs through the other stories as well, that the Irish really look to the past for solutions, 
uh, far more than they should when they really should be looking to the future. Exactly. So, Which turns out retroactively to have been correct, of course, because in, uh, in the last 25 years or so, Dublin and Ireland have become very uh, prosperous. And it's one of the, the best places to live in the world uh, yeah. as opposed to the impoverished world we see in Dubliners. Exactly. That's what we mentioned before. That's like James Joyce commentary, really, is that things can get better and things you can push things forward and they, they, they can get there. But to achieve that, you really need to have, um, uh, you know, your imagination and your vision um, uh, aimed at, like, figuring how to do things in the future and how to be more modern rather than just, like, being immersed in the past, right? Right. So uh, the boy, like we said, he doesn't have this uh, father figure in his life, and that's why he turns to... Uh, the priest, Father Flynn, as a role model. Uh, so uh, he begins, the boy begins to have all these visions of transcending that numbing tedium of um, uh, Dublin through a career in the priesthood, um, and that he starts imagining that what if he travels to all these foreign and exotic uh, places, and this is how he thinks he can transcend um, his situation. But again, Joyce here, we have uh, uh, an underlying commentary by Joyce that turning to the church um, to escape the oppression of Dublin is really like going to the, to the desert to escape thirst. Yeah, I think for Joyce, the, the church is the problem, not the solution. Uh, and, and the fact that uh, he uh, criticizes fathers throughout uh, the uh, text is also part of a kind of subtle critique of the Catholic Church because you know the Catholic priests are always referred to as father, father. so and so, mm -hmm. and so basically he subtly suggests that father so and so is not going to help you. Exactly. Yeah. Um, father Flynn himself demonstrates the futility of this escape as he babbles and he drools in the uh, throes of a fatal ailment of a suspicious and possibly uh, venereal nature. Um, he is a figure of the modern breakdown of authority. Um, Professor Booker already uh, pointed that out, who quite literally breaks down to like, it's like he literally gets so sick and he um, gets paralyzed and uh, he can't even like speak. And uh, so when we say that modern breakdown of authority, it's like that you don't have the proper um, father figure or parental figure because um, of that whole immersion in the past, okay? And, uh, you know, they're like the commentary on parents and fathers being always absent. And so we kind of literally see that breakdown of authority through this uh, character. Um, he's also a figure of Joyce's view of the moribund nature of religion. Uh, in general as a source of authority in the modern world. So uh, he says that in, in the modern world we're living in, uh, we really shouldn't have the Catholic Church um, because not, it's not that it's just, that it's only useless. It's, it's there, it's like a zombie. So it's there, it's alive, but it's ineffective also harmful at the same time right yeah but i think it's it's also important to recognize the situation was really uh very special in ireland where the catholic church had more power over people's lives probably than anywhere else in the world so people just couldn't move or do anything uh without uh, there being a you know a, a priest uh, condemning them for it exactly So the fallen paralyzed Father Flynn and his broken chalice may represent the failure of Catholicism to maintain its authority as a discourse of truth. Um, the chalice, when he drops it, it really contained nothing. And so this is really a commentary on how the church maintains its power and orders the daily lives of the old Dubliners um, 
like you already mentioned, like in every aspect of people's lives, like uh, condemning them, don't do this, you're not supposed to do this. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, they really, like it's just like empty. It's, it's, it doesn't have anything. It's like the, the, the chalice that he was carrying, when he drops it and it's empty, um, it just represents the emptiness and the voidness of this religion. Um, and so also it shows that uh, those people in Dublin have no hope that their obedience to the church will lead to salvation. Because it really literally would not lead to that, right? Right. The characters and the sisters and in all of the Dubliner stories um, seem paralyzed. Uh, why? Because they are unable to perform any act whatsoever that is not already defined for them. Uh, all their action, all their movement is conscripted. You're, you're supposed to act in this way. You're supposed to do things based on what is expected of you. And so that's why you feel like ev it's all predefined for them. And so they cannot, uh, you know, do anything that's like outside of that context. So after Father Flynn dies, um, the boy and his aunt go to view the body. And then there were visitors there and they are offered sherry and crackers um, by Flynn's sister. And here in this scene, it's an obvious uh, uh, reenactment reenactment of the Eucharist. Can you explain to us what that is, Professor Booker? Yeah, the Eucharist is really the holiest ritual uh, in Catholicism. Uh, it's a, a, a ritual in which, a, a ceremony in which people are given a little wafer, like a little cracker, basically, mm -hmm. some bread to eat uh, and a sip of wine to drink. And supposedly the the wafer, wafer the wafer represents, and not even just represents. I mean, there's a there's almost like a magical power supposedly invested in the wafers that it it sort of contains the spirit of God, but mm -hmm. it, it represents the physical body of the Christ. Uh -huh, yes. Uh, and the wine represents uh, the blood of Christ. You know, mm -hmm. the, the suffering and sacrifice uh, of Christ. Uh, and so it you're you're basically uh, imbibing of the spirit of God by mm -hmm. taking in these uh, wafers and wine. Yeah, and like in this, in, in, in this scene particularly, they were not really trying to do that. But it just shows you that when they were serving the crackers and the sherry, which kind of really represents that, it's just that they're conditioned to mechanically uh, enact uh, uh, church rituals without them really realizing that they're doing it, right? Right. And so also the women who are sitting at the funeral, they start speaking in funeral cliches. Oh, well, he's going to a better place. He's going to be in a better world, etc., etc. And so it just shows you that those people are thoroughly entrapped in pre-existing discourses that they can find nothing really new to say. So... They're just, you know, like acting a role that is already uh, written uh, for you. And uh, I really, I find it really interesting, especially the part about the uh, reenacting the, uh, uh, reenacting the Eucharist is just like really interesting. So and I think it shows uh -huh. how even in these early stories, Joyce is already uh, very highly developed as a writer, even if he hasn't gotten into the verbal pyrotechnics of his later style. Exactly. So the adult participants in this conversation remain totally oblivious to the obvious way in which the madness of Father Flynn, you know, he sits up by himself in the dark in his confession box, wide awake and laughing like softly to himself. I mean, he's really insane, but I think Joyce's commentary here is not about Father Flynn. It's about the religion as a whole. So he basically is suggesting that a, mad, that a madness at the heart of Catholicism itself. So uh, this madness made them think there was something gone wrong with him, Father Flynn, uh, 
Uh, but really, what is Joyce is really suggesting that there's something wrong with the entire religion, um, right? Yes, in particular with the institution of the church. Exactly. Okay, so now we get to the second story, an encounter. This story features an anonymous boy narrator, and he's probably uh, slightly older than the narrator of the sisters. Um, and uh, Professor Booker already commented on this, uh, having all these characters that are like slightly older from one story to the next. It kind of shows you that, you know, growth. Um, yeah, this boy might even be the same boy. We mm -hmm. don't know. We don't know. There's no information that would preclude that. Exactly. Um, so this, um, again, uh, all, wh why, does it, why does it not really matter whether this is the same boy or not? It's just because all boys in Dublin would be exposed to the same uh, oppressive limitations on their uh, attempts to define their own paths in life. So really it doesn't kind of matter whether you're X or Y or Z, like it's all the same, right? Forever. Right. Absolutely. So in this story, the boy and his friend Mahoney at least make an attempt to escape the restrictive society around them. Uh, the two boys plan a day of running away from school in which they will act out fantasies. Uh, those fantasies are really derived from adventure stories that they're reading from Amer the American West and other chronicles of a disorder that they have been reading. Um, the motif indicates the growing power of popular culture in the modern world. Uh, you know, uh, the American cult popular culture uh, basically spreading out throughout the world and the increasing influence of American culture, uh, like I said. So like I pointed out, these boys who want to run away from school um, uh, want to uh, uh, go and uh, be in an adventure uh, that is uh, an adventure similar to the idealized uh, uh, world of popular fiction and so they have all these kind of romantic vision visions that ultimately uh, run up against a rather sordid reality of how it is really kind of hard to transcend your conditions of life in uh, Dublin. So instead of having like this really awesome experience, uh, they uh, ultimately meet a queered old uh, josser who introduces them to the shadowy world of sexual perversion uh, by making sly suggestions that clearly contain uh, pedophilic hints. This is a motif, of course, that's most famous in literature in Gustave Flaubert's novel Madame Bovary. So it, it goes beyond Ireland in a way. And Madame mm -hmm. Bovary, Emma Bovary, reads all these romantic novels and everything and then uh, starts trying to uh, have those kind of experiences in her own life. And, of course, it always leads to disasters. Uh, and so there is there's a broader point uh, about you know, the relationship between fiction and reality but mm -hmm. certainly I think Joyce wants to imply that the situation is particularly acute in Dublin yeah and I think probably especially that these are just like mere fantasies and it's just as long as what you're trying that you're trying to transcend your situation by uh, fantasizing about being in a different situation that things are not going to work out really well for you right right all right so uh the radical disjun disjunction between the adventure that the boys envision and the reality they meet demonstrates the difficulty of constituting oneself in new and creative ways while trapped uh, within the stultifying environment of uh, Dublin. And then we have the sadomasochistic nature of the preoccupations of the old Josser that strongly emphasizes the dynamic of domination and submission 
that uh, so thoroughly informs Dublin society. So if you look at it and uh, if you take the uh, uh, that as a kind of a s uh, symbolizes the authority and the oppression of the uh, actually the Catholic Church and the British Empire over Dubliners and over their lives, right? Right, and I think the, the sadomasochistic elements here are, are something that really run throughout Joyce's fiction, which repeatedly suggests that there's something maybe a little bit sick about the Catholic fascination with pain and suffering, whether it be the pain and suffering of Christ on the cross or pain and suffering of sinners in hell or whatever. It just seems to be something they're a, a little bit too into. Exactly, yes. This story, Aveline, features a female uh, protagonist. So we're going to look a little bit at the, um, the treatment of uh, women in uh, Dublin. Eveline is the first story in Dubliners that actually features a female protagonist. And even though the majority of the stories in Dubliners do have male protagonists, there are a number of very prominent uh, female characters. That's one thing that Joyce is known for, is being one of the few male writers who is very good at writing about women. Uh, here, basically, we have this uh, teenage girl. She's a little older than the boys we saw in those first two stories. She's also a little older in the previous story in the book, Araby, which is not discussed in the textbook. Uh, but what's really important here is the change of gender, though. We have female, uh, a female protagonist as opposed to the male protagonist of the first stories uh, in the book. Uh, and that, that becomes very important uh, in a lot of different ways as the story goes forward. But it's signaled immediately by the fact that suddenly the narration is in third person instead of first person. So the boys in the first stories are sort of able to speak for themselves. Uh, but now, even though the story does... Uh, is narrated from Eveline's point of view, she doesn't get to tell her story. Somebody else is telling her story for her. Yes, exactly. Um, as Professor Booker um, has noted, that the boys, um, uh, the boy narrators uh, that we have uh, seen in the other stories are uh, unable to convert their newfound uh, sexual energies into an heroic selfhood amid the constraints of life in, uh, of Dublin. Um, but things and matters are worse uh, for the city's uh, women. So at least these boys have the agency to at least try out and attempt to go beyond like uh, uh, the, the, the conditions that are led there for them. But for the women, they don't even have that agency to think that they maybe I can try so at least they they the men are able to try even if the attempts uh, uh, ultimately fail uh, so uh, like I said in an encounter that happens but in Eveline in the intensely limited nature of the roles that are available to women um, in Dublin is emphasized through the depiction of the title character she's a young woman who lives alone with her violent drunken father who totally dominates her life so males um, in in dublin are dominated by the catholic church they're dominated by the british empire uh, but women are uh, dominated by these two and by the patriarchy like the boys in the in uh, an encounter uh, Eveline also uh, fantasizes about escaping her situation. Uh, she uh, attends a light uh, opera, The Bohemian Girl. Uh, and like I said, the boys in the earlier stories identify with and hope to emulate certain heroic uh, models uh, from the stories that they were reading. But the girl here in this story, Eveline, doesn't have heroic women uh, um, models to um, uh, look at and wanna uh, would want to emulate because those models are just like not available and so in the bohemian girl it is not the girl who is heroic 
it is uh, Thaddeus, the, no the noble exile, who saves her. And so Eveline starts basically fantasizing about having a male saver like Thaddeus to come and save her from her situation. So instead of having that agency that the boys had in an encounter, she just imagines the man with that agency who can come and save her from her um, uh, situation. So uh, Frank, of course, uh, uh, is the one that, um, that shows up and uh, he's a uh, sailor, okay? But again, his character is somewhat questionable. I think this is a good illustration of the way in which the stories are interlinked because Eveline wouldn't work nearly as well if you didn't have an encounter coming before it where you have these True. boys who read these chronicles of disorder and they're able to identify with the heroes and imagine having adventures. Mm -hmm. uh, but when Eveline watches the Bohemian Girl, the hero's still uh, a male uh, and so she doesn't identify him with him. She just identifies with the title character who's basically this this very passive character who has to just wait for a man to come save her. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. She doesn't identify with the one with uh, with agency, but the one who's being saved, and that is the girl. So it's really interesting. So Eveline's vision of transcendent uh, escape parallel those of the boys, like we mentioned in the earlier stories. Uh, she imagines that she will escape to exotic Buenos Aires, where she will find true love and happiness. Uh, but, like we said, what's important here is that she is unable to develop an heroic image of herself. She always depends on Frank to supply the heroism required to effect her salvation. So it's salvation through him, so he would be the hero. Um, and here's a quote that I'm going to read. Uh, escape? She must escape. Frank would save her. He would give her life, perhaps love too. But she wanted to live. Why should she be unhappy? She had a right to happiness. Frank would take her in his arms, fold her in his arms. He would save her. End quote. So as a young woman in Dublin, Eveline cannot act. She can only react. In the end, she turns away from Frank and remains with her father, whom she had promised her dying mother she would take care of. And again, so she's basically trapped uh, as an object within male uh, fantasies and unable to establish any vision of her own selfhood uh, outside of those fantasies. Uh, Eveline uh, will be equally dominated basically whether she stays with her father or she goes away with uh, Frank. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear from the story that if she somehow had broken free from her father and gone away with Frank that uh, her life would be just as bad and maybe even worse. Mm -hmm. uh, it really wouldn't have been a romantic escape. Exactly. Because it's an unrealistic fantasy. I mean, Joyce is all for people having an imagination and being able to dream of something better than what they have, but you also need to stay rooted in reality and come up with some plan that you can actually execute. Exactly. And so she remains with her father, like we've already uh, said, and um, although she really has no loyalty to her father, we said he's like really abusive and um, she doesn't probably even like him, but she just ex thinks that the society expects of her to be that sacrificial figure. And um, uh, so Catholic women in turn of the century in Ireland were often expected to sacrifice their happiness to care for their families. There would be like always this girl who is not married and she's basically sacrificed for the, like, you know, the happiness of her family to take care of her family. And so she just, you know, sacrifices her own love. Uh, so Joyce's Dubliners uh, all remain inscribed within discourses of power that have no real justification. And I really think that's like an important thing here, that one with where it says no real justification, because we have already discussed the power of the Catholic Church and, uh, and how it's kind of morbid power. <laughs> 
it really has no justification so if you just kind of try to uh, think outside the box and you try to let go of that past then you might transcend that reality like professor booker had already said if you also have a realistic plan of how to move uh, forward right right okay. all right now we get to our third story um clay 